this uh, Marocha, we're going to discuss the learning is for the Rafur for all the Cholim of Claudia Israel. Okay, so the next one, which we're going to have to probably, oh no, we can actually do this one, is called Bonne and Soter, which is building and demolishing. Uh, five prohibitions here assembling, constructing, or charging, changing the form of a substance. Structural repairs and alterations, for example, fitting a door on hinges, installing a window. Any form of demolition, for example, dismantling a door or window, hacking off plaster. Making cheese and building a snowman or making snowballs. Okay, that's... Uh, one may not erect or dismantle an overhead covering such as a tent or an umbrella, even though it is used for a temporary period. A tablecloth or similarly cover may be spread since these are not overhead coverings. A sukkah roof or cover used for protection against rain should be joined to the side of the sukkah before the festival commences in order to allow it to be opened and closed. A hood of a baby carriage may be opened and closed if it is joined to the baby carriage. The sunshine, however, may not be put into place since it is not joined. But if it is ready in place it may and opened in excess of 10 centimeters, it may be fully extended. There is a view which unconditionally permits one to cover a baby carriage with a net, which protects against insects and cats. A high chair or playpen may be erected or folded. And that's it. That's... Uh, uh, I think we know most of that anyway. So, uh, yeah, so that's just building and demolishing. Thanks, Kev. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we on 46B1, we've discussed the principle of following the majority uh, and the concept of the one who's seeking to exact payment from his fellow bears the burden of proof. And we, uh, which is the view of the rabbis. We've discussed Rav and Shmuel. Um, the previous discussion actually uh, began with Rabbi Yehuda's statement in the name of Shmuel that our mission of ruling is disputed. And Abraisa corroborates this, corroborates this assertion. It was taught similarly in Abraisa. We're on page 46b1. It was, um, if an ox gored a cow that had been pregnant and killed it, and the cow's fetus was found dead at its side. But it is not known whether the cow gave birth to the fetus before the ox gored it, and the fetus's death is unrelated to the goring, or it gave birth after the ox gored it, and the goring caused it to miscarry. The owner of the ox must pay half damages for the cow and one quarter damages for the offspring, while one half damages for the cow, because uh, if your ox is come and it kills a cow, you don't pay full damages if it's come. And then one quarter damages for the offspring, because if you were sure and you, there were witnesses that the offspring had been damaged and that's uh, uh, because the mother miscarried due to the impact, in that case, you would also pay half damages for the fetus. But since we uh, are not sure, Sumchus says that the damaged party and the damager uh, basically split it, where um, the uh, instead of half payment damages for the fetus, it's quarter payment, but not nothing. So these are the words of Sumchus, but the sages say that the one seeking to exact payment from his fellow bears the burden of proof. So what do we mean by bears the burden of proof? Is that uh, the damaged party is not going to be paid out unless there were witnesses testifying to the fact that the cow miscarried as a result of the impact of the ox and that that is why the fetus died not from a pre-birth anomaly now uh, what is this word from the majority uh, we understand from the principle of the majority well we say in the majority of cases it's unlikely that um, it would just be a case where the, uh, the mother would have brought the fetus for some random coincidence exactly at the point uh, by the time period where the ox happened to go. So since it's unlikely, uh, and the majority of the cases, everything that has an effect has a cause, you would assume that the ox created the miscarriage 
of the cow and the dead fetus, and therefore you would have to uh, pay, or at least pay half, according to Sunkhus. All right, so we're going to go on the uh, next section, and there's a scriptural sources for the sage's opinion. Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, from where do we derive the principle that the one seeking to exact payment from his fellow bears the burden of proof? Okay, because it states, um, if you have a look in Shmuel chapter 24, verse 14, basically before ascending to Har Sinai, Moshe told the elders that to remain behind, uh, Aaron and Aaron and Shura with you, whoever has a grievance should approach them for judgment. So actually, Moshe was going to be out of commission for 40 days, and Aaron and Chur were there to judge cases. Eventually, it became a case where we had, um, where Yitro turned around to Moshe and said, listen, you need to establish the elders and the Sanhedrin. But previous to that, there was just Aaron and Shur, Shur in his place. And what he's saying is that if anybody has a legal grievance, he should approach these two for judgment. So since the verse uses the Hebrew should approach them, instead of the more common uh, phrase, maybe should come to them. You know, it's, in other words, should come to them is more informal, should approach them, sounds quite ominous. Rav Shmuel by Nachmani expounds it as though it was vow last, meaning it should, when you approach somebody in an official manner, it means that you're there with decorum in order to present to them. What are you presenting to them? Evidence. So that the plaintiff must present a proof in order to, for them to take action against them. Okay, so he was saying that there's a, uh, there's a, because there's a scriptural verse where it's stated, whoever has agreed and should approach them, this means that the plaintiff, the one who's suing, that's what the plaintiff is, who has the grievance should present the judge as a proof. So the exposition is objective. Rav Ashi said, look, why do I need a verse for this principle? It's obvious, simple logic. The one who suffered from pain goes to the doctor in search of a remedy. Similarly, one who's distressed by an outstanding claim that he has against his fellow obviously bears the burden of inducing the court to act upon it. And guys, how do you think you get the court to act, act upon your case? Guys, how do you think you get the court to act upon your case? You go steal the, you go take the other ox. Um, actually, that- Get that, get that. That works. That works. That uh, that that uh, that does work, but unless you prevent evidence, unless you uh, actually have evidence, you have to return. So it does work in terms of collateral, but you need evidence in order to keep that collateral. So basically, in order to submit your case before court, you need evidence. Okay. So even Sumkus agrees that in a case where the defendant has possession of the disputed property, exactly as Gavin says. Um, that's, Gavin, uh, some course of view is slightly different, right? If I say that what you have is mine, I need to bring evidence because you have it in your hands. So you're saying something similar, but it's a little bit opposite because we're saying here that I claim that the car that you've got in your um, garage is mine but you have the possession of it. So in order for me to uh, get that car from you, I basically have to present evidence and say that you never bought it. Uh, a, that you need to present uh, slips that you purchased the vehicle, and B, that I've got as the um, plaintiff a document to say that you still owe me for that vehicle, okay? But if I say that there's something in the public area that you owe me, but you haven't laid claim to it. According to Sunkos, the court divides it, even if you had previous ownership of it, because the fact that you don't have ownership of it now means that, well, it's not in your hands. Why would you give up ownership of it uh, if it is truly yours, okay? So Rav Ashi contends that it's basically dealing with a case um, where, uh, where Obviously, if it's a case where it's obvious, that's fine. But we, uh, we, we de we're dealing with a more complicated case here. So therefore, Rav Ashi says, look, it can't just be saying that you need that verse. Because the logic tells you you can't present a case and win, Gavin, or, or keep the animal unless you've got evidence. So rather the verse is needed to teach a dictum of Rav Nachman in the name of Rabbi Bar Avuha. And... Uh, 
the dictum is as follows. Where is it derived that the court gets involved only with the claim of the plaintiff first? So, so in other words, we're dealing with a case of what? Where, say there's Reuben and he's the plaintiff and he's suing uh, for the claim of a loan against Shimon, who's the defendant, right? And Shimon basically says, you see some of my property and I'm not going to pay you the loan until you return what you see. Or maybe he says, I gave you an article as collateral and you used it and damaged it, you know? Um, so Shimon doesn't contend that um, he paid the loan, but he responds basically with a counterclaim. He said, listen, until you give me back what's mine, I'm not even entertaining your claim. So in that case, the court first deals with Ruven's claim and exacts full payment from Shimon, obviously providing Shimon has a document as proof. I mean, that goes without saying. Uh, and, and Ruven, and then only deals with uh, Shimon's counterclaim that Ruven seized or damaged his property. That's according to Rashi. All right, guys, does that make does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So it actually keeps uh, it keeps the two two issues separate, each loan separate, the the the, the main claim and then the counterclaim. It's yeah, not, so not, that, it's not They sorry. don't net the one off against the other. They actually you have to sort out the one issue, pay it out, and then sort out the other issue on the counterclaim side. Correct. Um, so listen, there is a bit of a problem because Tosford's wondering about some of the specifics of Shimon's counterclaim. So Tosford wonders basically if he proposes to bring supporting witnesses within like the 30 day period, for example, the court has to grant him a stay. Since even if he would concede liability, he would still be entitled to request 30 days to procure the funds uh, to pay anyway. In other words, what Toswat is saying is we don't understand why it would have to be necessary to urgently deal uh, with uh, uh, Shimon's claim. Because the fact of it is, is that Ruvain would have to get the money together anyway. So since he says he has to get the money together, he's given those 30 days to find proof of witnesses anyway. But you can you cannot use this as a delay technique, otherwise he could delay it indefinitely. So, uh, so Tosfut said, well, then why do you need a verse? So Tosfut basically says there's a case in which Shimon names the witnesses that he's going to bring. And the court knows those witnesses have knowledge of the matter. They know, but they, they're overseas, for example. Does that make sense, guys? And it's going to take longer than 30 days. So in that case, Rav Nachman infers from the verse that the court must still settle Ruvain's claim immediately and then treat Shimon's counterclaim as separate, a separate litigation. That's what you need the verse to say, not the obvious. So again, to summarize, um, what we are saying is, let me just quote each opinion separately. Uh, what we are saying is that the first thing is Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmani said that there is that verse uh, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 14, which discusses that you need evidence. And Rav Ashi is saying, well, what do I need a verse to tell me? It's obvious, okay? You can't bring, you're not going to successfully win a case without evidence. Then um, uh, Rav Ashi says, look, I'm going to reinterpret it. There's a dictum of Rav Nachman in the name of Rav Ahuva, Avuha. And what does he say is that the court only deals with the plaintiff first. That's what the verse is coming to tell you. It doesn't deal with the defendant. So you sort out first uh, that uh, if, if Ruvain borrowed money from Shimon, Ruvain has to pay it back first. And then his counterclaim that Shimon had something of his as collateral, etc., is only returned after he's paid. Because that's the whole reason, Gavin, you're right, that he has collateral. In other words, if your ox damaged my ox, you're not going to say, I'm not going to say I'm going to return your ox because how do I guarantee <coughs> that I'm going to get paid from you? It's my only leverage. So the court will say to Gavin, uh, Gavin, pay Damon first and Damon will return your ox. So that's what the dictum is then. And then Tosford is saying, well, listen, there's a bit of a problem here. What's the problem? The problem is quite simply that... Uh, 
you know, it's not, it's not, it's, it's not that, it's not that obvious, and there might be certain other factors, meaning that I've got a legitimate uh, counterclaim, but I say that I need the money to get together anyway, to be able to pay the person I owe money to. I'm not arguing that money, and since I've got that time anyway, and the witnesses that I have in mind, the court knows them, they're from the community, but they're away in the meantime, I can get about a 30-day stay. But I can't postpone the case indefinitely. That's what it's saying. Because I can only postpone it to the degree of time that it would take me reasonably to get the money. And I can't make that time period up. That time period is set by the court. So if in the interim I'm granted a stay, that's fine. That's to get the money together. But the money is to be get together in order to pay. That's the whole point. You can't use it as a delay tactic. Otherwise, every witness I'd phone before I went to court, I'd say, guys in the community, who's gone overseas lately? Who's doing seven months in yeshiva? Give me a couple of names. If you give me a name, seven, like seven years. In seven years. years. Yeah, they're getting their smicha in Yerusha line. Yes. Give me their names. So if that's what smith Exactly. And somebody's so, starting smith. Exactly. They're starting smith. So basically, um uh, for for it okay um so there is an exception made the nahadians say sometimes the court does get involved with the claim of the defendant first and what is this case it's where the defendant's properties are losing value on account of the plaintiff's suit against it okay so what we're saying is the defendant has to sell some of his properties in order to pay because he's out of cash flow, right? So say, for example, uh, uh, Ruvain is the defendant and he owes Shimon money. But Shimon, in the meantime, has confiscated uh, some of his properties. Now he's got one property left and he urgently has to pay Shimon back according to the courts. But if he sells his property in a rush in order to fulfill his court edict, what do you think is going to happen? People in the community know that he's cash strapped and desperate to sell an account of the lawsuit so they want to spare him undue loss because they're saying that people will take advantage of him now i know that gavin says well jews shouldn't do that to jews but then if jews treated other jews and people treated other jews properly then there would never be a court but people and don't treat both each other properly they don't so therefore uh what happens is it deals with the counter suit first okay and maybe if necessary grants him even more than 30 days to corroborate his claim why so he can settle the dispute without selling his land so what he's saying is that if he's uh, got a counter claim that has to be addressed first otherwise the situation is going to bankrupt him because he has to fulfill the uh, the payment due to the plaintiff so we see what he has to say first. There's no loss in hearing what he has to say. Because otherwise people are going to take advantage of the situation. All right, let's go to the next part. The Mishnah states, similarly, if a cow had been pregnant uh, and gored um, by an ox, etc., the Mishnah ruled that it's unclear whether their offspring is included in liability. The damaged party collects half damages from the body of the cow and one quarter damages of the body of the offspring. So uh, the Gemara wonders, does he collect half damages and one quarter damages? But it's only half damages that the damage is required to pay, since we are obviously dealing with a cow that is come. Okay, what is this business of three quarters damage? So before I explain it to you guys, what do you think the Gemara's question is here? What about three quarter damage? Yeah, explain what the Gomorrah's issue is. Uh, I want to see if you guys have done because or know what's going on. Is it? No, we don't. I, was I've gone. To, I didn't have the notes. <laughs> I've Good gone one. over it. Damon, yeah? is it related to uh, TUM? To a TUM payment? Is that why it's only three quarters? Maybe um, that's why. Okay, it's not, that's it's not a full payment. So Maybe no, that's the, why. Look, you partially right. Is that the Gomorrah say, look, if it's time, the worst case scenario is I pay half payment damages. Now you're asking me to pay uh, half payment damages and one quarter damages. You pay asking me to pay like three quarters if you add it up. 
which is no. more than you would pay for a tom. So it's not, it seems unfair. Okay, that's what the Gemara is saying. Okay. But you're not, but you're not, you're not damaging one, one animal. You, not, you're not damaging, you're damaging one object. You're damaging two things. The, the feces possibly as well. So I Fe think that, um, I think that is part of the answer in that I think what Gavin wants to say, just clear me up if I'm wrong, is that it still works up to half. And in fact, less than half, because what we say is as follows. If you kill, if you hit a cow and kill it, your cow kills a cow of 200 zoos, you pay 100 zoos. If you, if you kill a cow, your cow kills a cow of 150 zoos. Uh, sorry, if you kill a 200, if your cow kills a 200 zoos cow, then it's time you pay 100 zoos. And if you have an ox that kills a cow that's worth 150 zoos, then it's time you pay 75. So you're not paying more than you owe. You just have the unlucky uh, day where your cow was also pregnant and you've lost a greater degree of damage. Just like if your uh, ox was gored and it happened to be a fatter ox than a thinner ox. That's just bad muzzle. It doesn't mean you technically pay more. So is that what you're alluding to, Gavin? Gavin? F. Gavin, I'm talking to you. Gavin. <laughs> Sorry, my, my, my Bluetooth link dead. Sorry, I, it's, it's on now. It's fine. How do you know you lost me? All right. Uh, what I'm saying is, Gavin, is if you've got a... I just a, lost the last minute. Minute and a half, that's all. Sorry. All right, well, give me a chance. I can repeat it. So what I'm saying is, uh, if your ox happened to go an ox that was... Uh, 200 zoos and it's time you are 100, okay? If it was yeah. 150 uh, zoos ox and it's time you are 75. So what I think Gavin's trying to say is you're not really paying more. You've just got the unfortunate luck of having your ox score a pregnant cow. So whatever that cow's worth pregnant, you're paying more anyway for what it would be worth without a fetus. So it's not like you're paying three quarters damage. You're actually paying less because what's happening is that if it was sure uh, if you had absolute evidence that the uh, cow miscarried you'd pay half for the fetus and half for the cow it's not half and half equaling to one uh, it's not half and half equaling a full payment it's half of the total but here we've got half of the total of the cow we know and the uh, half of half which is one quarter of the fetus because it's suspect as to whether you owe the damage or not so it's not like you're paying you add half and half or you add half and a quarter to say three quarters you're actually paying less than half because the issue of the fetus uh dying as a result of miscarriage is in doubt you're not paying more than a half at best even if there was evidence that uh, your fetus in the cow died as a result of the goring, you'd only ever pay half, but you're paying half of the value of the cow and the fetus together because they were together when it was gored. Is I think you've you come off well because you've got about a 90% chance that that is your fault that that fetus died. Correct. So, but, uh, uh, Sumkus, uh, I think you actually win. So, Sumkus is saying actually that uh, in, a, in a way we originally thought that Sumkus helped uh, uh you know we if you want to hold the law of the majority meaning the statistical probability is that it did miscarry then it uh, it would be fine but we don't hold like that the sages hold that the damaged party would have to bring evidence as to the fact that his cow miscarried uh as a result and that's why the fetus died you need evidence as to the timeline if you don't have witnesses, you can't claim. The burden of proof is on the damaged party. Sumko says, I hold by the law of the majority. And since I'm not going to go against the rabbis, we're going to have a happy medium. What's a happy medium? Both parties are miserable. That's the compromise. So the damaged party has, uh, has to uh, get half and the damager has to only pay half. Okay? So what I'm saying, Gavin, in answer to your question, is that you're not actually paying half and a quarter. 
you know, because you're just paying according to the value of the animal. So worst case scenario, if you had evidence that it was a miscarriage, you only pay half, which is the total of the cow and the fetus. And if you have no evidence, then you're only paying half damages of the cow. Since it's in doubt, you're paying half the half damages of the fetus and the full half damages of the cow. That's pretty straightforward. All right, now we're going to go on. So the Gomorrah's question is, you're not really paying half and a quarter. You're not paying three quarters. Fine, the Gomorrah elaborates. Okay, now if the cow and its offspring were the property of one owner, the damaged party would indeed be able to tell the cow's owner, whatever you choose, in other words, whether you assume the cow gave birth before it gored my ox or afterwards, give me half the damages since in any event, liability rests on you, okay? Meaning it was your property, okay? Either the cow alone or the cow with the fetus that committed all the damage, and thus I may collect the entire amount of half damages for you. So the Gomorrah suddenly switched to the second part of the mission. Let me just tell you, there's two parts to the mission. The first part is what happens, now it's just switched. It's a, the first part of the mission is stated, look, I've got a, a, a cow uh, that's dead and a fetus at the side of the road that's dead in a public way. And your ox gored it. And therefore, do you owe for the fetus or not? For the cow, for sure you do. For the fetus, we're not sure if it was the body shock that caused the miscarriage or the timing was just uh, pretty coincidentally close, but you've got no witness. Fine. What was the second case of the Mishnah that we dealt with yesterday? The opposite. We said, what happens if you had a cow with a fetus inside and then that in turn killed another ox? If you ask me how that's possible, I have no idea. It doesn't have a sharp horn. I have no idea. Uh, let's say maybe the ox was grazing on the edge of a cliff. I'm using this as an example, on the edge of a cliff. And the cow being pregnant was very sensitive, as women that are pregnant often are, and thought that the ox wanted to have its way with her and she was pregnant and she was having none of this. And since she was unhappy, she figured, the, why, uh, why take a chance? And she ran the ox, minding his own business as men often do, just neatly, just looking at her uh, and grazing on the side of the road. And apparently it was stair rape or whatever. So what this cow did is she, uh, she, she uh, butted this ox off the cliff. And then all of a sudden, the owner of the ox said, I saw what your cow did. And your cow and your fetus owes for the damage to my ox because he participated the fetus in the killing. Now we don't mean participated as said yesterday with regards to being conscious. A fetus isn't really conscious of what's happening in this world. It's like in a, I don't know, it's like an alternative universe in its mother's womb, whatever. It's in a, like a different dimension. So the thing of it is we don't mean participate is like you participate in a farm. What we mean is that since the mother was worth more because she had a fetus within her, the claim for the tum damage is against the cow and the fetus, which is a limb of the cow. So if the fetus was part of the mother, the cow is now worth more because that cow is a heavier weight and it's got a potential calf within it. And since it's, remember to use the term fetus and calf, or, or, or fetus, not in calf, fetus and um, offspring, fetus and offspring, because that offspring is, is not dead. The reason why in the first point uh, of the mission had never called it offspring is the fetus never lo lived long enough to become offspring and become a calf. In the second part, it was the cow that was pregnant that gored the ox that knocked it off the cliff that gave birth to a calf. Then what the question is, is the owner of the ox will say, look, at the time when you, your cow uh, knocked my ox off the cliff, it was pregnant. Therefore, since you're paying time damages, I want the time damages, including the pregnancy of that fetus, because your cow then is worth more with the fetus, 
And therefore you owe me more money because you're paying from the body of the attacking animal. And what does the damager say? No. Uh, actually, uh, Markel gave birth to the calf before it gored your ox. Okay? Now, the damaged party now needs evidence to show that the cow was pregnant at the time with witnesses or whatever. Otherwise, without evidence, the rabbis say you cannot claim for the fetus or the offspring in this case. Okay? However, Sumcha says that, uh, that you just split the difference. There's one problem I have, not with Sumkus, but understanding Sumkus, is in the first case, the law of majority or probability exists that if you have a, uh, in a public uh, field or, uh, or whatever, a uh, dead cow, a dead fetus, it's probable that since the ox called the dead cow, it created the cow to abort the fetus from a miscarriage. It's probable. When the cow had a fetus and was doing the attacking, there's no way to guarantee the probability of her being pregnant because the, uh, the, the, the calf itself or the offspring was born healthy. So how do we know it was um, pregnant at the time that it uh, killed the ox and therefore we, able to, uh, we have to pay more because you're paying from the body of the attacking cow? Well, you can't work on probability then because it's a 50-50. So um, it's still Sunko says you divide the difference. And the sages say, no, the burden of proof lies on uh, the damaged party. So I could understand Sunko's case more in the first part than the second part. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's not that Sunko is illogical. It's that I don't understand Sunko correctly. He might have a perfectly logical explanation. So Sunkhus might turn around and say, out of deferment to the rabbis, uh, I suggested that we go half compromise, okay? Because I really hold that it was such a high probability that you should pay. But since the rabbis say that you need to bring evidence, I'm gonna go halfway with the rabbis. But in the second case where it's a 50-50, our Sumkhus would still say, let's split the damages 50-50. So that in my head is the way Sumkhus would answer me. Am I making sense, guys? Yeah. Okay. So since that is the case, uh, we're saying, well, um, what's, what's the story here? Now that it's switched positions, it says, now if the cow and its offspring were the property of one owner, the damaged party would be able to tell the cow's owner, whatever you choose, whether you assume the cow gave birth before it caught her ox or afterwards, give me half damages since in any event that liability rests on you. Okay? So what it's saying is, it was your property, whether the cow acted alone or it had a fetus, your cow committed all the damage and I may collect the entire amount of the half damages from you. But that doesn't make sense to me, that discussion, for one reason. It's because you can, the one thing is you pay half damages. The second leniency is you pay from the body of the attacking animal. So since the attacking animal, if you want to say that the uh, attacking animal, the half payment damages, it was, it was a heavyish animal, then you're covered with half payment damages either way, whether the cow was pregnant or not. But if the cow was very scorny, post-birth, okay, or pre-pregnancy, and after the pregnancy became fattened up, and you might have collected only 70% uh, of your time damages because the attacking cow on its own was puny, but with a calf made up the full damages of the time, uh, then this argument doesn't hold water. Because in any event, the damager would end up saying, I'm paying you half payment to the limitation of what my attacking animal was worth. So uh, the, the damaged party then has to take a knock. So I don't get that, to be honest. All right. So the Mishnah's ruling is needed only for one case. Where the cow, and this makes sense to me now, where the cow is the property of one owner and the offspring is the property of another owner, 
So the liability is divided between them. So it's obviously answering my question. It's saying, look, the reality is you can't claim more for what the attacking animal is worth. Okay? Because uh, you don't have to pay either way. You have to pay to that limit. But what it's saying is that the Mishnah can only argue when they've got two owners, where there's two liabilities. Because if I say, let's just put a timeline here. Um, uh, I knock, uh, my cow knocks Kevin's ox off the cliff. Okay? Now, Kevin's getting evidence and witnesses or whatever. And in the interim, my uh, cow births a offspring that becomes a calf, and I sell that calf to Gavin. Now, all of a sudden, Kevin comes to me with a lawsuit, and I say, look, uh, I will pay you the value of the cow. Any offspring damage, which was in the cow at the time, because you've got witnesses that say the cow was pregnant, speak to Gavin. I'm only going to pay you what the cow's worth now. Because Gavin's the new owner of the offspring. If I owned all of it, then it's up to me to make restitution as one owner. So that's where the argument comes. What happens if somebody now owns the offspring, the calf, and somebody else owns the actual cow? Because the offspring has been sold. So guys, it's saying this case is really only needed where there's two owners. Because uh, basically, uh, if Kevin comes to me, also, I'll pay you from the cow, but any extra value the cow could have had uh, is now paid from um, Gavin because he owns the calf. doesn't come from my portion. He's got the benefit of the calf. Okay? So uh, the Gomorrah states a further qualification. If the damaged party went ahead and demanded payment from the cow's owner first before approaching the offspring's owner, he can indeed tell the cow's owner, your cow certainly damaged me. Give me proof that you have a partner and then you may deflect part of my claim from yourself. In absence of such proof, however, you carry full liability. So what I would basically say to, uh, uh, what Kevin would basically say to me is I say, no, Gavin's got the calf. He's a partner. But Kevin would say, I'm not interested. Unless you bring evidence to the court that you have a partner to pay for the uh, refracted damage caused by the offspring portion of value, then I'm claiming that whole money from you, Damon, because you are my point of contact. You have to deflect uh, with evidence that there's another party involved. So the thing of it is the Gomorrah seems to show uh, that there's two opinions. The one opinion, and this is the problem, uh, which we're going to see now, is that the Gomorrah says, look, for the time payment damages, half the payment of the time comes from the cow's owner, and half of it comes from the offspring's owner, when they're two partners. Now, there's a problem, because Toswot's got a problem with that, and I agree with Toswot. Toswot is saying you can't do that. It's not fair that, that you split the cost difference 50-50. You can't do that. Does that make sense? You can't just split it 50-50 because the offspring of the cow wasn't worth half the cow. So that's, so Toskot said it's proportional. Some of the other rabbis say no. Okay, so basically we're dealing with a case where the damaged party went ahead and demanded payment from the offspring's owner first before approaching the cow's owner. So that the cow's owner may tell him the following, okay? Uh, so basically in this case, Kevin's ox went off a cliff because of my cow. And he knows I've got a partner in Gavin who bought the calf. So Kevin goes directly to Gavin and says, you owe me for half the damages. Um, and according to, uh, according to the rabbis, Kevin's got evidence from witnesses that my cow was pregnant at the time. So Kevin's got the witnesses. Says to Gavin, you owe me half. Then when Kevin comes back to me and says, Damon, you owe me half, I'll say, listen, there's a problem here because you have revealed your opinion that I have a partner in liability and your claim against me is for only half damages of the usual amount. 
Thus, I will pay you one quarter of the damages, and you must deal with the offspring's owner regarding the other one quarter. Although he will only pay half of that amount, one eighth, since his liability is actually questionable, I'm under no obligation to make up the shortfall. So let me tell you what it's saying. It's amending it. It's saying, look, at the end of the day, is that Kevin is owed half payment damages for his cow. Uh, and the calf and the mother were one entity because before she gave birth to the offspring, she had a fetus. And therefore, what happens is I owe Kevin, um, I owe Kevin, what do you call it, half payment damages for the body of my cow because it's a tumult. So in that case, I say to Kevin, look, you came to me, I know you approached Gavin, because Gavin came to claim plane to me. So I'll tell you what, of your half payment damages, half of that I will pay you, and half of that Gavin's responsible for. So he pays the half of the half, which, which is a quarter. But Gavin only pays one eighth. Why does Kevin, uh, Gavin only pay one eighth instead of one quarter? Because I owe a quarter, and Gavin owes a quarter to make up half and that half payment is for a tum ox payment to kevin the reason why gavin owns owes a quarter for his offspring is because it's in doubt kevin hasn't brought witnesses so therefore sumchus's opinion is that when in doubt gavin only owes instead of uh what he would have owed for the fetus he only owes half of that so when we were two different partners okay I owed, half, uh, I owed Kevin half for my cow damaging. He owed half for the offspring. And then in that particular case, what happened very simply uh, is that uh, I paid Kevin my half and I say, go get from Gavin. Uh, unless you've got witnesses, you can only get half of what Gavin owes you, which is actually, if you had witnesses, it would be a quarter from Gavin, a quarter from me making up Kevin's half. But since there are no witnesses, Sumka says that it's uh, only half for the fetus of what Gavin would owe, therefore it would be one eighth. Does that make sense, Gus? Yeah. Kev, does that Thank make you. sense? Yeah. If, if not, I can explain it in one more sentence. Okay, let me try one more. You're talking about the doubt, that's why it's only. Uh... Okay, so let, let me just explain one um, simple sentence. One simple sentence. My cow was pregnant and tum. Okay, it was allegedly pregnant. I knock your ox off the cliff. That was worth 200 zoos. It's a tum cow, so I only owe you 100 zoos. 100. You've in the meantime gone to Gavin because you know that my cow birthed. Okay, you know that my cow birthed. And uh, it became a calf. And Gavin now bought the calf from me. This is months after. And you are saying to Gavin, you owe me your share and Damon owes my sh uh, me his share. So when you come to me, I'll say, yeah, Gavin complained to me already. So you know what, Kevin, since you didn't approach me directly, Gavin's share is Gavin's problem. I only owe you half of the half because Gavin's my partner. And therefore it means I owe, Gav I owe you, Kevin, only a quarter because my quarter would come to you, and Gavin's quarter would come to you, meaning that uh, equals a quarter and a quarter is a half, meaning I only pay you, owe you half payment damages because my cow was tum. But lots of luck collecting from Gavin, because although it's true that I sold my calf uh, to Gavin, you don't have evidence as to the fact that my cow was pregnant or had given birth at the time when my cow knocked your ox off the cliff. So since you can't prove it, I'll give you half of half, which is my portion. And Gavin, you can't collect his half of my half because it's in doubt. You don't have witnesses. You might know that Gavin bought over my half, but you don't have witnesses to prove that my ox was indeed pregnant at the time when it knocked your ox off the cliff. They only ever saw the ox being knocked off the cliff by the cow. And they know that I walked the cow earlier in the day, so they can put two and two together. And they know I only own one cow, Betsy. That's it. So therefore, they know that, but they don't know her state of pregnancy and if she was pregnant. So therefore, I owe you half my share, which is a quarter to make up 
half of half. And Gavin, as my partner, would have owed you a, a quarter to make up a total of a quarter and a quarter equals half. However, you haven't got evidence as to the fact that Gavin's calf happened to be in my cow as, an, uh, as a fetus at the time when my cow knocked your ox off the cliff. Therefore, according to Sunkus, Kevin owes you, uh, Gavin owes you, Kevin, only half of what he did had you had evidence. So therefore, Gavin pays you one eighth. Because what would have happened if you had evidence is my quarter and Gavin's quarter comes together to make half. At the time, so I only owe you half. Since you don't have evidence, I'll pay you my half, and Gavin pays you half of that. Um, so, in, sorry, I'll pay you my half of half, which is a quarter, and Gavin would owe you a quarter. But since it's in doubt and you don't have witnesses, Gavin pays you a quarter, half of a quarter, which is an eighth. So I pay you a quarter and Gavin pays you an eighth. And that's the problem when you approach the owner of the offspring first, because you really put yourself into a stupid position. Okay? Stupid, stupid thing to do, that's curious. Yeah. So um, uh, an alternative version. We're nearly done, guys. We're nearly done. I know you're teaching. Um, an alternative version, some say even if the damaged party went ahead and demanded payment from the cow's owner first, which is the intelligent thing, the cow's owner can deflect him and say, I know that I have a partner in liability and I'm responsible for only one quarter of damages, okay? A buyer's explanation is rejected, okay? Because um, uh, Ravan now is coming to a buyer and saying, look, what are you talking about? I can't just make that claim of the cow's owner. I, in, other, in other words, that I've got a partner. I need to prove it before the court. So this is rather, so a buyer's re explanation is re rejected. Okay, that's why it's rejected. I think. Rubber said, does the Mishnah state that the damaged party collects one quarter of the damage from the body of the cow and one eighth of the damage from the body of the offspring? No. Half Damages from the body of the cow and one quarter damages from the body of the offspring is what's stated. So, uh, what it's basically saying is Rav has got his own explanation. He's not bringing a rejection of his lack of evidence before the court. He's saying, listen, there's another interpretation. Rather, Rav has said, actually, we're dealing with a case where a cow and offspring are the property of only one owner. And this is what we mean to say in the mission. If the cow is here and available for collection, the damaged party may collect the entire, entire half damages from which is entitled from the body of the cow. Okay? And obviously, why? Because in order to pay for time, you need the animal to be present. But if the cow is not here to be collected from, the damaged party may collect only one quarter damages from the body of the offspring. So this is what Rab is saying, Kevin. A buyer is saying that there were two partners. Okay? Uh, um, well, uh, the Gomorrah is saying there are two partners, and a buyer is saying that one owner can deflect and say, I have a partner. And the Gomorrah is saying, well, where's your evidence you have a partner? But Rab is saying, listen, I don't agree with the buyer's response that there's even two different owners. I'm saying there's one owner, and the cow's already given birth, so therefore you went from a fetus to an offspring to a calf. Now, if the calf, if the cow is available, I paid all from the cow. If the cow has made a disappearing act, then I have to pay from the calf. What happens if the owner uh, doesn't get all his money? Well, as Gavin quite rightly said, you should have kidnapped the cow's collateral. Now you have to take whatever you can get in terms of what the offspring is worth. Okay? Um, so, um, Ba ba so, to which is okay. So we on forty seven A one, and we're going to finish in uh, Kevin. Uh, it's five oh eight. How long do we have, sir? Oh, about five twenty. Perfect. All right, we'll be done. But if the car is not yet to be collected from the damage party, may collect only one quarter damages from the body of the offspring. Why one quarter? Because it's in doubt. Was the car in fact pregnant? Uh, at the time when it attacked or not. 
uh, you, you don't know. So then for some constraints, you can't collect the half payment damages, maximum a quarter. So when the missioner says half damages from the cow and one quarter damages from the offspring, it's referring to two different cases. The Gomorrah infers the reason that the damaged party collects only one quarter damages from the body of the offspring is that we do not know whether the offspring was with the cow unborn when it gored or not. But if the cow were clear to us that the offspring was with the cow when it gored, the damaged party would be able to collect the entire amount of half damages from the body of the offspring. Obviously, guys, providing that the offspring is actually worth that much. Otherwise, uh, you just pay whatever the offspring is worth. It might not have got to the stage where it's as big as uh, recovering your half damages back. In explaining the Mishnah thus, Rubber uh, follows his own reasoning for Rubber said, if a pregnant cow to damage is a thumb, the damaged party may collect half damages from the body of the offspring. What is the reason? The fetus is part of the cow's body. However, if a chicken bearing an egg did damage as a thumb, the damaged party may not collect his half damages from an egg. What's the reason? The egg is merely a secretion of the chicken and is not part of the body. Okay? So um, what we're saying is it only occurs for the cow because the cow is considered to have a limb. It's part of the cow. It's not an external secretion. Okay, so that's clear in terms of the chicken. Now, um, let, me, uh, let me just check one thing. Okay, so there is something that you've got to uh, uh, got to understand that um, uh, the basic assumption through the previous discussion, guys, is uh, that the, if the cow was pregnant when it gored, when its own and offspring's own are equal partners in the damages. In other words, this is what I had a problem with, is that it's saying because both of them did it together, Gavin who now owns the offspring, pays for half, and I, who owns the cow, pays for half of Kevin's ox. And Toslip says it doesn't make sense. It can't be that. Because obviously the offspring wasn't worth to that value. So Toslip explains that the numbers one quarter and one eighth are used here figuratively, not literally, for the sake of simplicity. So the Mishnah treats the case as though partners were equal but actually it means to convey the concept that liability of the cow's owner is reduced because he's assumed to have a partner that, that the offspring's owner makes up only half of the shortfall because his liability is in question. So all it's done is figuratively turned around and said that whatever my portion is, the cow is no doubt of the damage and not the ox of the cliff. Because we're not sure, and Kevin doesn't have evidence as to whether my cow was pregnant at the time it knocked his ox off the cliff with uh, Gavin's calf. Now there's no dispute as to the fact that my cow gave birth to an offspring which became a calf which Gavin bought. But the question is, was it pregnant at the time when it knocked the ox off the cliff? And since Kevin doesn't know, whatever Gavin's portion is, it's half because Kevin doesn't have the evidence. And my portion as the cow uh, would be to make up what, whatever I owe. So it says, it says basically, I owe whatever I owe uh, Kevin in terms of my portion of liability half because it's come. And then Kevin would owe, uh, sorry, Gavin would owe half of that whatever his fetus was worth because it's in doubt. Okay, let me give you a mathematical example. Okay, so say for example, there's a uh, I've got a cow worth 80 zoos, Arthur. I've got a cow worth 80 zoos before it became pregnant, right? And when it became pregnant, it's now only worth 100 <clears throat> Which makes sense because a cow's not going to gain more than 20% of its mass, 25% yeah. max. So that's fine because it's a fetus. It's not that big. It's only when it gives birth that it, uh, it grows quickly. So now myself and Gavin have an 80-20 partnership. That's all in terms of the liability. And if it goes to an ox worth 200 zoos, what are oh Kevin if it was tum? 100 zoos, right? So therefore, therefore I owe 80 zoos. Okay, are you with me? I see you typing. Yeah. No, 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 I'm just taking my watch off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You said 
So, Kevin, let me just give you, let, let, let's just go through this. We've got six minutes, then we're done. So, the thing of it is, your ox was worth 200 zoos. My cow knocked it off the cliff. Now, my cow was pregnant at the time, but you don't know that. You've got no evidence. My cow was worth 80 zoos, and now being pregnant, it's worth 100 zoos. Why? Because it's gained in mass. Uh, it's skin. It's hard as stretch, so the hide is worth me. Okay? So, uh, uh, Gavin, you have just tried for a few more minutes. Gavin, no, 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 I have a like. Gavin just... is a twenty percent owner, and Kim and I'm an eighty percent owner. So, if there's two hundred zoos worth of damage and it's a tum ox, then I only owe Kevin technically a hundred zoos. Okay, but because my ox, my cow is only worth eighty zoos, I pay Kevin eighty zoos. Now Kevin runs to Gavin to get that other uh, 20 zoos. But Gavin is saying to Kevin, I'm not giving you 20 zoos because you don't know that at the time when Damon's cow bought uh, your ox off the cliff, that that in fact was pregnant with my calf. Yes, Damon's calf, cow gave birth to my calf, but who's to say it was pregnant at the time of the goring? So unless you can bring witnesses, we go according to Sulchus, where you say I owe you 20 zoos, I will give you 10 zoos and you take a 10 zoos head. And you got your 80 zoos from Damon. Okay, that's it. Perfect. Just Thank say you. that again, who the 10 zoos, wait a minute, just uh, so Gavin, he, he bought the calf. So the calf. Okay, let, uh, no, let's start with the top total. Ox, dead. Should have been 100. 100 Should have been 100. Should have been, been 100, 100. damages. Fine. You now only got my, 80. My ox, if only 80. Worth. The damaging ox was worth 80, so only got 80, not 100. Okay, hang on a sec. It was worth 80 before it was pregnant. It was worth 100 when it was pregnant. Okay? So I turned around and I said to you, listen, as far as I'm concerned, it's not pregnant. And even if it was pregnant, before it's pregnant, it's worth 80 zoos. So, Kevin, you're not collecting 100 zoos from me. Here's, here's my cow, 80 zoos, keep it. If you've got any claim for the 20 zoos value, go to Gavin. Because he, he owned the, uh, uh, the portion. You run to Gavin and you say, I want my 20 zoos. Gavin says to you, really? I know Damon, I bought Damon's calf, but who says it was pregnant at the time it knocked your ox off the cliff? So therefore, I'm going to give you a half, according to Simplus, because it's in doubt. It happened in public territory, not on Damon's farm. So therefore, uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's, it's public domain. It. it has to be neutral territory, and also you can't prove it. Otherwise, you get the twenty zoos. So you get ten. You got eighty from Damon. Go home miserable, satisfied. I don't care. So you only got to say it got ninety percent of what he should have got, which is uh, yeah. Well, the main thing to bear in mind when you're saying this over is you got everything that you were owed from me from the cow, and you only got half of what you were worth from Gavin's fetus because you couldn't prove it. Okay. Um, so that's, and in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the issue, okay? We've got three minutes, guys. I just need three minutes. Okay, the Gemara returns to the Mishnah's first clause explaining how damages are set when an ox scores a pregnant cow. Rubber says, we do not assess the value of a cow by itself and the offspring by itself in order to determine the amount of damages. Rather, we assess the value of the offspring together with the cow. Because if you don't say this, you'll be found to impair the damage by assessing damages at the higher rate. He's correct. He's saying, listen, by the time the offspring comes out, it's now a viable entity. Who's to say that the fetus would have lived? You can't end up saying uh, that now that it's worth. It might have died stillbirth. Who knows? So you've got to take what the cow was worth pregnant. In other words, did it fatten the cow by 20%? Yes. Did the skin stretch so the hide was worth more yes so you have to take what the cow is worth pregnant but not as separate features from the offspring and the cow because then you're going to come to an unfair <clears throat> amount uh, because uh, they weren't separate entities at the time of the gordon okay so rubber continues uh, giving several precedents and so to you find regarding one who hacks the hand of his fellow slave and so do you find one who damages his fellow's field. So all it's saying there is 
if you cut down a fellow's saplings or his cattle ate this fellow's vegetable patch, you don't work out uh, what that individual uh, patch is worth on the on the market of selling it. You say, look, what was the whole point? What was the whole plot of land worth? And what was the percentile of that land before the patch? So you look at it in perspective. The same thing as the slave's head. You don't say what is a head worth. You say uh, if you know. You say. What is the whole slave worth in terms of a body? Fine. What percentage of the hand did that make up the body? Now that the hand's useless, you can say the slave was a scrub. You owe everything for the slave. He said nothing to him. You, you've got to yeah. take it in proportion. That's yeah. all he was saying. Just one sec. Oh, one sec. Yeah. Uh, Rav Acha, the son of Rabba, said to Rav Ashi, because Kevin's got to go in a minute to teach and then we'll stay yeah. on the questions. Rav Acha, the son of Rabba, said to Rav Ashi, but it is the law that the damaged party is entitled to compensation for the cow and the fetus separately, then let the damager be impaired. Why should we make an assessment that is more lenient to him? So basically, Rav Acha, the son of Rav uh, Ava, uh, Rav Acha, the son of Rava, is contradicting Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi is saying you take them together. Okay? Rav Acha, the son of Rava, is saying you, you take it separately because either way, one of the parties is going to be impaired. So Rav Ashi replies to him, it's because the damager can tell the damaged party, I damaged a pregnant cow of yours, and I will set the damages for you based on the reduction in value of a pregnant cow. Okay? Yeah. So the Gomorrah further issues pertaining to the assessment of damages to a pregnant cow, it's obvious that when the cow is the property of one's person and the offspring is the property of another one, and the cow miscarries on account of being gored, Compensation for the value of fattening the cow that had resulted from pregnancy goes to the cow's owner. But with respect to the value of expansion of the cow's body through pregnancy, what is the law? Does compensation for the loss of the value go to the owner or the fetus's owner? So they say, look, you fattened the cow because it was pregnant and needed to end to eat. That goes, uh, that goes to what the compensation you would make to uh, the cow. If the fetus had a separate owner, for example, then the, the weight gain of the cow belongs to the cow's owner because he fed the animal to make sure it had reached pregnancy maturation without miscarrying. But if the hide in, increased as a result of the pregnancy because of the expansion of the fetus, uh, that's the argument. Rav Papa says compensation goes to the cow's owner because uh, uh, it was the owner that fed it and made sure it, it was achieved. And then uh, Rav Acha, the son of Rav Mika, said the cow's owner and the offspring divide the compensation. Uh, in, in other words, the difference between the, not the fattening, but the, the other accrued benefits. Okay? So Rav Papa said compensation goes to the cow's owner. Rav Acha, the son of Rav Mika, said the cow's owner and the offspring divide the compensation not of the increase of weight, but of the hard that, for example, expanded as a result. And what's the halacha, guys? The halacha is that they divide the compensation. Right, guys, we went from 46B1 to 47A2. Well done. We've done over in Amud. Ah, I think we should finish ah. us in about five years, Lachlan. 